Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to, uh, back to the second section on uh, reasoning and judgment. Now, in the last class we looked at what is reasoning and how does reasoning differ from something called judgment and decision making. And uh, we define reasoning, judgment and decision making as higher order cognitive functions which basically mean that uh, reasoning, judgment and decision making inclu and including problem solving. Uh, these are the culmination point of any uh, cognitive process or any cognitions. Uh, now, what do I mean by this? As you discussed over and over again, the basic processes of perception, attention, learning, memory, they take in information from the environment and create mental representations and store it into the memory. What problem solving and uh, reasoning, judgment and decision making do is make meaning out of these representations by manipulating the representations in specific patterns or in specific ways. So, that is what uh, these things do. Now, what is reasoning? Reasoning is basically using certain well known principles or using certain rules of law to validate a certain premise. So, that is what reasoning is all about. So, reasoning is making information or making from based on some previous evidence making meaning of some mental representations or making meaning from some from information which is stored into the memory. Judgment is basically a step ahead of what uh, reasoning is and so what judgment is basically is to look at evidences provided by reasoning and to make a uh, to to make number of choices available or basically to judge or to uh, gather evidences uh, against all the alternate interpretations which are available for a particular mental representation or a particular information which is in memory and this is in making is a step ahead of uh, judgment in which what we tend to do is we tend to choose among all the alternatives which are available through judgment. So, what judgment tends to do is basically it, it uh, sorts of filters all the available interpretations which are reasoning and uh, decision making then goes ahead and makes a choice of what particular kind of uh, interpretation from the data that you want to keep. Last class uh, with these informations we also look at something called focus on errors and so why focus of errors are needed and we looked at the fact that focus of errors the study of focus of errors is needed because errors tell you what is the uh, amount of or what is the number of hindrances which are available in making correct interpretations and so looking at errors uh, basically provides you with a lot of information of what to do and what not to do and so knowing about what not to do actually trains helps you train in a particular way of thinking so that is why we need to focus on errors now beside that we also looked at uh, two different kinds of deductive reasoning which was there and these were syllogisms or syllogistic reasoning and something uh, uh, something called conditional reasoning syllogistic reasoning and conditional reasoning so these two type of reasoning that we looked in the last class now in terms of syllogisms uh, what we tend to do is we tend to validate the existence of a conclusion from a premise. So, premise are statements in, in syllogistic reasoning. We are given certain statements which are called premises. Now, these premises are valid or invalid. So, we have to decide whether they are valid or not. And so, based on this validity, we judge whether a particular conclusion following two premises or two statements which are there logically follow or not. That is what we do in syllogistic reasoning. So, in, in terms of syllogistic reasoning in another word what we tend to do is couple of statements are given each of the statements are uh, valid and so what we then, then need to do is based on what the statements are we need to define whether the conclusion that is coming out of it is valid or not and that is what is syllogistic reasoning. Then we uh, looked at some factors which produce error in syllogistic reasoning for example, atmospheric effects, bias beliefs and so on and so forth. 
Beside that, we also looked another kind of deductive reasoning, which is basically called the conditional reasoning. In conditional reasoning, what we have is we have a statement which has an antecedent and a precedent. And these antecedent and precedent part of a statement is in the form of if and then. And based on this statement or looking at this statement, what we tend to then do is go ahead and validate the existence of a conclusion. So, basically a, a statement is given and the statement is in a if then form and we then look into it. Uh, after looking into it, there is a conclusion which is given and we need to then look at the conclusion and a second premise is also given. So, based on a statement and a premise, we have to decide whether the conclusion logically follows or whether it is validated or not. And we looked at four optional things which can happen. So, once we have a statement in the if then form which has an antecedent and a, and a consequent, following that we have as a premise. Now, the premise can uh, with the with the statement with the if then statement the premise can make four different kind of possibilities. One is the premise can uh, affirm the antecedent, it can deny the antecedent, the premise can affirm the consequent and the premise can deny the consequent. And based on that a conclusion is given and we have to uh, basically go ahead and tell what whether the conclusion is valid or not. Now, the conclusion validate the conclusion there are some shortcuts or heurists in, in this kind of a reasoning and that is tolerance and what does ponens. And what does it really mean? So, every time we affirm the antecedent or we deny the consequent the conclusions are valid. So, these are the out of the four possible responses these two will always be true. So, if the premise is validating the antecedent or denying the consequent in those terms the conclusions which follows from the premise and the statement will always be true. So, that is what a conditional statement or a, con or a conditional logic or a, or a conditional reasoning really works. And beside that we also saw several uh, factors which go ahead and, and uh, produce errors in conditional reasoning. Now, one thing is in deductive reasoning we always look at validity of a statement. So, validity of a statement says that the fact that whether the, the conclusion is a logical uh, conclusion or a logical following from the premises or the precedence which has been given. We never look at the truth conditions. So, there is a difference between a truth conditions and, uh, and, and, and a valid condition. A valid condition may or may not be true, but a truth condition is always valid. And so, that, that is the uh, one difference. And so, in these inductive reasoning, we never look at that. Another interesting thing that we that we have to understand is that deductive reasoning is basically uh, coming from general to specifics. So, you have a general conclusion some general conclusions given to you and then you have to go ahead and uh, testify or verify specific statements and that is the format of what a, a deductive reasoning is. In today's class, what we are going to do is we are going to look at another form of reasoning which is called inductive reasoning or inferential reasoning. And so, in inductive reasoning what we tend to do is we, we tend from specific we need to generalize statements. So, specific instances are given and from those specific instances we have to come up with a general conclusion. And so, one primary difference between uh, uh, inductive and deductive reasoning is inductive reasoning it is basically coming from general to specific. So, it is more of less like a top down process and so what happens here is that there are certain general conclusions which are being given and a specific thing has to be uh, or a specific statement has to be validated against it. In comparison inductive reasoning goes the opposite way certain specific statements are given to you and so from those specific statements you have to then go ahead and follow a general conclusion and so that is what inductive reasoning is all about. So, this is one difference which is there. Now, in terms of deductive uh, reasoning we always look at the validity of the conclusion and so that is the core of deductive reasoning whereas, in inductive reasoning we look at conclusions in terms of the strength. So, conclusions are never 100 percent valid and 100 percent true and so we always in deductive reasoning we look at the strength of a conclusion. So, how strengthy or what is the probability of the conclusion to be holding true and so that is what we do in inductive reasoning. So, inductive reasoning is making inferences and all around the world or all around you, you will always look at in inductive reasoning. So, another kind of reasoning is inductive reasoning. Let us then go ahead and understand what inductive reasoning is all about. So, in inductive reasoning we reason from specific pieces of data or information towards a general conclusion. For example, statements like Barney is a dog who barks and from that 
and then Talon is a dog who also barks, Robin is another dog which also barks and from that if we conclude that all dogs go ahead and bark is basically what is inductive reasoning. So, there are three specific statements which are there, I have shown you three different or I have uh, narrated three different instances of it. So, all three uh, dogs that I have mentioned actually bark and from that if we go ahead and conclude that all dogs or most dogs actually bark is what is inductive reasoning. So, this is from coming from specific data to general data specific to general and so that is the kind of reasoning that we need to do here. So, unlike deductive reasoning where conclusions are labeled as valid or invalid on in terms of absolute certainty, we do not look uh, this in inductive reasoning. What we tend to do inductive reasoning is it leads to uncertain conclusions that vary in strength. So, from the very outset itself inductive reasoning implies the fact that the conclusions will be uncertain, they will not be certain at all. In terms of deductive reasoning the statements are always certain and so the what we need to do is find out the validity of the statement, but in inductive reasoning we know that the conclusions are never fully certain. And so, what we need to do in inductive reasoning is to find out the strength of certainty which is there. So, we never get a 100 percent certain statement. For example, look at the three statements which have been given here. Now, the first statement says that professor X gets upset when asked if she will issue a paper extension. And then there is another statement which says professor Y would not accept late papers and a third statement which says that professor Z takes 20 percent off each day if a paper is late. Now, there are three statements which have been given and so in inductive reasoning we now need to conclude and so the more obvious common conclusion from these three statements out there could be that professors most professors actually do not like late papers. As you see professor X gets upset, Y would not accept late papers, third Z would deduct some amount of marks from your late papers and so it is believed from here we can conclude that most professors actually do not like a late paper and so that is what is inductive reasoning. Right. So, Bizan and Corkman in 1984 describe some characteristics that seem to typify inductive reasoning. So, that is how we uh, do deductive reasoning. So, these people they gave some characteristics that seem to typify what inductive reasoning is all about. Now, the product of indu inductive reasoning it is not necessarily correct inductive arguments are evaluated in terms of strength rather than in terms of their validity. So, basically it is saying that inductive statements what, what it says is that inductive statements are not always correct in nature, inductive arguments are not always correct in nature and so assuming that most people or most professors will not allow late papers will lead you to not submitting a late paper and so even if there is a chance for a late paper submission you might miss it. So, if you make this kind of statements or if you make this kind of conclusions the strength of a conclusion being very weak that most professors do not go ahead and accept late papers then even if there is a chance for you to give a late paper you will not attempt it because this is what the conclusion is and you you kept the strictness you made the conclusion in a strictest possible sense and so you are not availing that thing because these are just three pieces of data and from these three pieces of data you are making a general conclusion and so even if there is a chance for a late paper you might not follow it and might not get a chance to submit a late paper which might have happened from any reason. And so, that is what it says. So, one of the things is that arguments the inductive arguments uh, conclusion of the inductive arguments are evaluated in terms of their strength rather than in terms of the validity. So, it is not in terms of validity conclusions from uh, inductive arguments are not evaluated in terms of whether they are valid or not, whether they are logically following or not. It is evaluated in terms of whether uh, it is certain or not or whether it is necessarily correct or not. And the second point to be noted here or the second factor or characteristic of inductive reasoning to be noted here is that pointed out that inductive reasoning there is a need for constraint on the kind of conclusions that you would draw. Now, since inductive reasoning is coming from specific to general all kind of conclusions can be drawn from it. And so, we have to be very constrained of what conclusion we are drawing in inductive reasoning. And so, this is one thing that we have to note. We cannot draw very weird uh, statements or very weird conclusions out of it. For example, one weird conclusion that can be drawn from this particular thing or this particular statement which has been given at the top here. Uh, example, look at statement 1, 2 and 3 is that 
professors with the name x, y and z will not accept late papers and this is not true because if we draw this kind of a conclusion that these kind of professors which have name x, y and z or has an x, y and z on their name they will not accept late papers is not a valid conclusion and so there is no truth into it there is no certainty into it and so this kind of constraints has to be looked at or this kind of constraints have to be we have to be very aware of these things. So, in inductive reasoning two things we have to when making conclusion we have to be very very uh, or we have to be worried about two things first that we, have, we do not actually look ahead at the strength uh, at the validity of our conclusion we look at the strength of the conclusion right and the second thing in inductive reasoning we have to be very sure about is that we should not be making two unconstrained conclusions. So, if you make two unconstrained constrained conclusions then it is not a good to be very about this. Now, there are certain what type of rules or instances support inductive reasoning, what kind of processes support mental structure support inductive reasoning. So, researchers disagree on whether induction is based on formal rule based processing or more complex bound experience based on heuristic processing. So, this, uh, there are division of uh, people or there are division of psychologists who, who differ between what kind of mental processes work into it. So, there are groups which believe that there is a strict rule driven or a strict formal logic driven way of looking at how inductive reasoning work and there is another group of psychologists who believe that it is more context bound it is more about a heuris which is there. Now, the rule based view term uh, as the strict or stylistic view says that inductive reasoning involves special processes and representations that operate in the abstract outside any real life context. And so, what this view believes that the rule based view believes that inductive reasoning basically follow a rule based system and so, there is a logic to it, there is a rule based system to it and this rule based system works in an abstract manner outside any real context to give the conclusions. Whereas, in terms in ex, uh, direct ex, uh, opposition to this the context based view or a loose view as it is called they contend that inductive reasoning involves updating the strength of one's belief based on recall of specific instances. And so, the loose view or the contextual view says that inductive reasoning is based on how quickly can you validate your belief from past experience and that will give the strength to the conclusion that you are drawing. And so, this is what the difference is one group looks at the strictness of logic or strict or they believe that rules and logics are followed and that leads to this kind of a reasoning or inductive reasoning the other group believes that it is our beliefs or it is our past experiences which strengthens our belief on the logic on the conclusion that we are deriving from inductive reasoning and that leads to a good inductive reasoning or those processes leads to inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is present everywhere and that is why I have written the omnipresence of inductive reasoning. Omnipresence is a phenomena where something is present everywhere and so that is what we tend to do here. So, omnipresence of inductive reasoning really means that inductive reasoning is present everywhere and we will look into it. Yes, inductive reasoning actually is present everywhere in most problem solvings or in, in terms of most problem solving strategies inductive reasoning is the idea about it. Two examples of specific city of the omnipresence of inductive reasoning is it is used in categorization. So, remember from the section on categorization and concept we look at something called categorization. So, what do we do in categorization? Mostly in categorization what we tend to do is we look at specific elements and from the specific elements we find the commonality and from terms of the commonality then we go ahead and then form a category. So, those factors which are common in many specific uh, instances form the rule for the categorization and that is basically coming from specific to general. So, induct and that is what is inductive reasoning, inductive reasoning is coming from specifics to general. So, inductive reasoning provides another view or thought with phenomena known as something called typicality can be viewed. And so, in uh, not only in terms of categorization the answer to typicality effect that we saw in categorization and in semantic memory can be explained in terms of inductive reasoning. Now, look at the statement which has been given here. There are two statements that I have one is Robin is susceptible to disease A therefore, all birds are susceptible to disease A this is one statement and the other statement is turkeys are susceptible to disease B and all birds are susceptible to disease uh, I am sorry this should be A 
A is here correct here and should be correct here. The thing is in which of the statement do you think people are going to be forming more uh, definite conclusions. So, which of the statement has more conclusive or has more strength in terms of certainty and so you will see that most people then turn out to the fact that statement 1 is more true. The reason for why the statement 1 is more true is because robin is a more typical bird and so it is a more typical bird and so the conclusions are more valid and so it is more of a it represents more of a bird and that kind of inductive reasoning or that kind of a specificity from there we draw the conclusion and so drawing conclusions in terms of this is better than in terms of this where turkeys are more typical bird and so in this case the conclusions drawn from statement 1 is has more strength in terms of believability. Now, subjects rate argument 1 as more likely to be true because robins are seen as more typical birds than turkeys and that is what I have been telling you that statement 1 is verified by more number of people simply because of the reason that robins are more typical birds. Now, another interesting phenomena observed in inductive reasoning about categorization may, this may be something called the diversity effect. So, just like as we have seen in the typicality effect there is something called diversity effect. So, what is diversity effect? Now, look at the two statement which have been given here and tell me which of these statements are more likely to be true or more likely to happen. So, we have statement 1 which says that Rob Robins are susceptible to disease Y, sparrows are susceptible to disease Y, therefore all birds are susceptible to disease Y. Other hand we have these uh, statement which says cardinals are susceptible to disease Z, turkeys are susceptible to disease Z and therefore all birds are susceptible to disease Z. So, which of the statements do you think should be true and if you are like most general people you will believe that statement 2 is more true than statement 1. The chances of the believability of statement 2 is more than statement 1. Now, the reason the reason here is that because cardinals and turkeys are two end of the extreme. So, starting from cardinal to turkey a whole range of birds come into it, but in terms of robins and sparrows they are very close together kind of close together birds which are there. And so, in terms of believability effect we believe that if you want to look at all birds then cardinals and turkeys this statement too tend to hold more weight or tend to generate more believability in subjects than statement 1. So, in this case people rated argument 2 is stronger because cardinals and turkeys represents more diverse set of birds and that is what I have been saying. Since cardinals and turkeys are on the two extremes of it they are more diverse kind of birds different kind of birds. So, more different kind of birds are tend to have a particular disease we believe that most birds have it. But since uh, sparrows and robins are the same kind of same birds. So, people do not believe it and so this is another fact with something called inductive reasoning. The second fact, so inductive reasoning is not only in terms of categorization or it does not only solve the categorization problem, inductive reasoning is also seen in problem solving. For example, one kind of problem solving which is called analogy using problem solving using analogy basically this inductive reasoning is used. So, another set of cognitive process that depends critically on inductive reasoning is problem solving more specifically solving problem by analogy. Now, remember the radiation problem and the war problem or the war attack problem major problem war major problem that we have. Now, the thing is in, in these cases the problem was solved by using an analogy. So, since in the since in the radiation problem it was solved by using many lasers of smaller strength or smaller value which summated the, uh, the amount of heat that is required the amount of the strength of uh, the laser that is required for curing a disease by using many lasers. The similar thing was used for the uh, by the major by making an analogy to this radiation problem and so he uh, then took a number of tanks by different different bridges and so attacked and won the war. So, this kind of a thing. So, basically what does this analogy that we uh, that we saw that the major did in terms of the medical problem and the radiation problem. What he tend to do is he tend to look at two specific instances and from there he deduced this thing that uh, one way of using a major strength or one way of increasing strength of a particular thing is using small bits of uh, and, uh, uh, sources or many sources with smaller energy. So, many sources of smaller energy is equivalent to one source of bigger energy. Why? Because many sources will sum it up to, bigger, to equalize the energy which is out there and so this is the generality which is there. So, one of the thing that happens in terms of inductive reasoning is inductive reasoning is also available or is also used in uh, problem solving. So, that is a end to the inductive reasoning thing. Now, the next step in uh, uh, 
the uh, section is about judgment. So, what is judgment? Inductive reasoning involves arriving at general conclusions based on specific pieces of what might be called data. So, inductive reasoning is basically arriving at conclusions, general conclusions based on specific data segments which are out there. So, for, uh, uh, from specificity to generalization is what induction is all about. So, but what is judgment then? So, judgment is an extension of inductive reasoning. Hatsey and Doe 2001, they define that judgment is the human ability to infer, estimate and predict the character of an unknown event. So, in judgment what we tend to do is inductive reasoning will only provide you with a conclusion, but what we infer from the conclusion, what we estimate or what we predict from the conclusion is what is called judgment. So, judgment is that particular branch or that particular higher cognitive process which does what is which looks at the data, which looks at the conclusion which has been provided by reasoning and from there it makes inferences or it makes predictions. And so, judgment is a process of making predictions and inferences from data or from conclusions which have been drawn through reasoning from data. This data is available out there through the basic cognitive processes. And so, this reasoning are of two types, the deductive or the inductive reasoning. And so, judgment is basically inferring or making conclusions out of it. And once the conclusions are available, choosing one of these conclusions based on cost benefit analysis, based on how much you want to gain or how much you want to lose is what is called decision making, which we will see in the next section. So, let us go ahead and look at what is judgment. So, then judgment is a process of making educated guess based on limited information along with our previous knowledge, expectations and beliefs. So, basically stereotyping. So, what judgment tells is or what judgment follows or what judgment predicts is that they are judgments are basically educated guesses which are based on some kind of limited information. If all the information is available, we will not make limited guesses. So, as you know mostly in the world, we do not have all the information available with you and so there is always uncertainty. And so, inductive reasoning is also done in terms of uncertainty. When we know do not know the premises or we do not know the validity of the premises, we do inductive reasoning from specifics to general right that kind of a thing. And so, when we want when we make educated guesses on the limited computer on the limited information which is available or due to limited computational power of the brain that we have, we make judgments right along with and how do we do it? We do it in the basis of the knowledge that we have, the previous knowledge that, that we have, uh, some kind of expectation that we believe and some kind of beliefs that we hold on to. And this is also equivalent to stereotyping. Stereotyping is making some kind of a prediction or making some kind of a category for certain kind of people or labeling people by a certain category or a certain characteristic is what is stereotyping. For example, we tend to do all kinds of stereotypes, poor are thief, riches are uh, also thief, this kind of people is that, that educated people are more nerdy. Uh, so, this kind of people is that and so all these kind of stereotyping that we tend to do women are poor in mathematics, men are very good in mathematics and so on and so forth. So, this is basically stereotyping. Stereotyping is classifying people based on certain labels or certain characteristics and that is what judgment is all about. So, given the fact that whatever knowledge we have, whatever information we have and whatever experience and belief we have, we merge all them together and then make a give a statement and this statement is basically what is called judgment. So, uh, basing judgment on memory. So, there are three kinds of purists or there are three kind of mechanisms which are used for making judgments and these judgments are dependent on memory. And so, the first kind of judgment that we tend to do or the first kind of purist that we use in making judgments are called the availability heurist. And so, what is it all about? The availability heurist, they indicate that we base our estimates of likelihood or probability uh, on the ease with which we can think of example. So, as for example, if I give you this question that in your whole life, the number of people that you have known, what is the probability or what is the one letter of the English language from which their name starts and so from all the people that you know. Now, immediately your answer will be S or R or uh, T or whatever it is, S and R are the more two, two best example which is there. Now, the thing is it is basically called you have fallen to something called availability errors. The reason that you know that S is the most commonly used name out there and so most names are existing or S in the even the in the English dictionary most words are there from S and so you will believe that S and R are more common names and so this is this has to be it and that is what availability heurist is all about. Availability heurist speaks that the more close that we have the more number of 
uh, examples that we can think about a particular problem the, that uh, uh, that is what is called availability heuristic and so you making predictions based on that is what is called availability heuristic right and so that that is the definition of it so the availability heuristic is dependent on two main sub processes the availability heuristic so again def defining what availability heuristic is if we tend to make judgments based on the fact that how much example is uh, available to you or the ease with which we can think about an example that is called availability heuristic the easiest uh, way that that is there which we can think of an example if that is how we make our judgment that is availability heuristic right. So, is basically why do we need heuristic for judging the we need heuristic for making judgment because the uh, three things the data may be huge first of all the data available to you is huge and so we cannot go through an algorithmic approach finding the judgment. Second thing we may lack the com computational power since the data is huge we do not have enough computational power to go ahead and compute the outputs of it and so we use a heuristic. And the third is that computational power is there the data is huge and it is ambiguous in nature and so we tend to use heuristic for doing its shortcut and so that kind of thing is there. Now, the availability heuristic it depends on two main sub processes which is there the first is called bias encoding. Now, why does the availability heurist actually be there? The availability heurist actually be is there because it could be an encoding problem or it could be a problem lead to retrieval. As an encoding problem it uh, availability heurist can happen because an overestimation of certain facts in memory are done because you tend to overestimate certain things right now as I asked you the question of how many people uh, that you remember from a certain English language the idea is that since you most people that you meet or this knowledge which is given to you is that S is what you tend to meet or R is what you tend to know of more people this kind of over representation in memory basically makes you use the uh, availability heuristic. Now, this in turn makes the bias retrieval from the memory as the information stored in memory is bias example media overestimation right. So, one of the things for probability heurist is bias encoding and this bias encoding could happen from media also. In our day to day world we look at a lot of media we look at a lot of news a lot of uh, information which is out there and so these informations they are or most of the time they are biased and the fact that since media feeds us with so much information and there is an effect which is called recency effect right. So, the media since feeds us with, uh, feeds us with so much information we tend to believe it or for example, one of the thing that can hap happen in availability heuristic is since the media has been trying all along these days that for example, looking at here what is happening is that the weather is going to be foggy and so we, even if it is sunny since the media keeps on saying this over and over again and everywhere we talk to people we tend to believe that it will be a foggy weather since it is winter and so on and so forth. Even if the weather is very sunny the conclusion that it is winter or the fact that it is winter and that media is overestimating something that leads to the fact or uh, using a for that leads us to make use of the ability to rest and predict that or uh, basically uh, think that the weather is going to be all foggy. And so, one of the reasons is this thing the availability heuristic is bias encoding. Now, bias encoding also can happen with uh, it is as I said there is something called the recency effect or these days the media uh, if you go into the media it is all about political we all believe that most people are at this point of time are turning towards Hinduism are turning towards the construction of the mandir or that kind of. Thing. Now, the media is feeding this information to us and so we believe that all over India this is what is going to happen that most people are turning towards Hinduism or favor the Ram Mandir or whatever this kind of information is there. And so, this is what availability heurist is. Since the media is feeding us this information this is the claim that we have made or this is the idea judgment that is we, uh, we have made. And so, we also turn ourselves to that kind of a thing or align ourselves to it because we tend to believe that this is what it is. Now, although if we look into if we go all our, on our own and uh, start looking at people's belief system or what people believe all over India talking to different different people, we may not find the kind of representation that media is giving us right. And since we are trusting the media the kind of representation that they are giving based on that we believe that this is what the uh, nature of or this is what the mood of the country is based on what they are saying. Now, another kind of effect or another kind of reason for why available is a success, success is something called bias retrieval. And what does it mean? It says the availability can lead us to astray from sampling process bias in the sampling process. What does it mean? So, at times the retrieval of information is also bias from memory and that leads to the availability uh, or that leads to the kind of bias which is there. 
for example try the following and state whether there is more of number 2 statement or more of number 1 statement tell me six letter words that have a letter n in the fifth letter or a six letter word where the fifth letter is an n how many do you think will exist so whether you think this is more or the second is tell me words that fit the pattern i n g now which do you think is going to be more and so obviously the answer that most of you are going to come up with is this one is more the second is more than the first now if you realize that this is i n g ending right and so if if you believe that this is more you are wrong the reason being that this is a subset of the second is a subset of first so all ing words will be six letter words with a fifth letter n being an ending but there are also other words which have a fifth letter than n and may not have an ing ending and so one two is actually a subset of the letter 2 or the statement 2 is subset of 1 and so then it can never be more than this and so this is another problem which is there a biased uh, retrieval itself since the way we retrieve information itself is biased that can lead to the use of availability heuristic and the third thing is called illusory correlations and that can also lead to the availability heuristic setting in and what does it really mean in terms of illusory correlation it says that primarily co coincidences two events will seem to be linked when they are really not and that is what is called illusory correlation so if two events uh, tend to happen together and just because of uh, uh, just because of a coincidence we tend to rate them together for example we often hear state saying statement that cricketer was not playing very good in the first match he didn't play very good the second match he didn't play very good third match and fourth match bam then he hit a century and so this kind of a correlation saying that three times he didn't uh, play good and the fourth time he hit a century and so that was making the correlation between three three Uh, after each three time you perform better that type of idea that if if you perform three times bad the fourth time is always good is illusory correlation making correlation that way so because each time the hit the place the probability of what he tends to do the probability of how the output turns out to be is only 0.5 either he does good or does bad and so each event is independent of itself so basing the our idea that after three uh, bad runs the fourth run is going to be a good run is illusory correlation or something another example is sports illustrated jinx saying uh, the same thing that i was talking about that if some some uh, something bad is going on or if some particular model or sports person appear on some particular journal sports magazine and since this sports magazine is known to ruin the life of many people if a person who is doing good in sports appear on that particular magazine front cover then his life is going to get bad is what is availability heuristic and so this is illusory correlation and so this kind of a correlations are also the reason for availability heuristic now another kind of thing that we need to know another kind of information that we heuristic that we tend to use is called the recognition heuristic and so what is recognition heuristic is often used when we are faced with two alternatives one that we recognize and the other that we don't recognize and so in cases that uh, the information which is available to you through reasoning one information we recognize very nicely the other recognition we don't have an idea about we tend to pick up that recognition we tend to pick up that data point that conclusion which is available to us or which we are familiar to and that is called the recognition uh, heuristic so in this case what happens is if two conclusions are drawn from a body of data uh, and through proper reasoning we tend to make judgments favorable in terms of the one statement which we are close to or which we recognize better than the one we don't recognize better and this is called the recognition heuristic and that recognition heuristic is, is the leading cause for the availability uh, availability heuristic or the availability um, the heuristics that we tend to use in making judgment now another kind of heuristics that we tend to use in making judgment is called the representative uh, representative heuristic and what is this it is basing judgment on similarity now t at times we tend to make judgments we tend to make conclusions draw conclusions from evidences based on the fact of how similar a particular set of data looks to us so when we are trying to place a person in a particular category our judgment we rely on representative heuristics rely on representative heuristics the degree to which people represent a basic idea of that object for example if we see somebody who is 6 feet 2 tall and he is walking immediately bam we we tend to think that this person would be a for a basketball player 
because somehow it is related it is similar that people who are tall are basketball players. Similarly, if we see uh, and then we have several kind of examples of somebody who is white, somebody who is fair, somebody who is not fair and all of these are related to certain certain kind of similarities which is out there and so this is what is represent, uh, representation here is. So, what does the definition of this says? It is rely on representative here is the degree to which an object represents a basic idea. The more object or more a event represents in our memory a particular kind of category, the more representative we believe it is to be, the more similarity we believe it to be and that is what is called similarity heurist or representative heurist. Now, why do we get, uh, fall to the idea of representing heurist or why do, do we actually make errors in representation or repre why do we use representative heurist? One basic problem which has been or one basic reason why people tend to use similarity heurist or representative heurist is because they ignore something called uh, base rate fallacy. Now, what is base rate fallacy? The base rate fallacy is any event has a certain rate of occurrence, a certain base rate of occurrence and so if we over represent that, we ignore that base rate, we tend to fall into this base rate fallacy. So, people mostly commit the base rate fallacy and what is it? Ignoring the rate of occurrence of a particular category in a particular sample, right. And so, let us say if we know a family of people in which two people are tall, let us say the son and the father is tall, we tend to believe that everybody plays a basketball in that family. Now, that is called base rate fallacy. The, the event of father and son or the instance of father and son are independent of each other and that does not say that everyone is tall in the family and so we cannot say it is a family of basketball players. Even in any basketball family, uh, not everybody will playing it and the idea that everybody is a sports person in that particular family is wrong and that is called base rate fallacy. That is how often a certain event tends to occur. So, when we tend to ignore the fact that how often a particular uh, event is going to occur, a certain event is going to occur that is called the base rate fallacy, thereby getting a bias of similarity. For example, consider the classic demonstration by uh, Kahneman and Trevesky. So, Kahneman and Trevesky presented a problem and I will show you that problem. So, he gave this statement to people and gave the following instruction. Now, a panel of psychologists have interviewed and administered personality test on 30 engineers and 70 lawyers. Now, all successful in their field. Now, on the basis of this information, thumbnail descriptions for each of these individuals have been written. For each description, please indicate the probability that the person described is an engineer from 1 to 100. So, a certain kind of statement is given and in that statement there are certain base rates which are given and that is what people tend to overrate. Now, base rates are there are 30 engineers and 70 the lawyers out there and the, in total they are 100 and what we have to tell is that a description is given to you and this based on this description you have to tell me whether the person I am describing is an engineer or not and then rate it in 1 of 100. And so, what is the description? Subject were then given the following description. This is the description which is given. Jack is a 45 year old man. He is married and has four children. He is generally conservative, careful and ambitious. He shows no interest in politics and social issues and spends most of his time on many hobbies which include home carpentry, sailing and mathematical puzzles. This kind of a person profile is given to you. Right? And so, then you are asked to do this. So, subjects were rated on the rate of probability that Jack was an engineer. What do you think happened? What is the probability that Jack was an engineer and immediately you will say that it is above 50 percent or 50 to 60 percent. What you are ignoring here or you are making an error, this is incorrect. The thing is, these words that are used here in terms of his hobbies which says that he is does carpentry, sailing, mathematical puzzle makes you believe that he is an engineer. But you know that in this particular thing 70 percent people are lawyer and so there is never a chance that you will have 70 percent or they will have 50 percent chances that he is an engineer. There are only 30 engineers out there and so that cannot be extending uh, 50 percent right and so that is the error that you are doing because the base rate is only 30 engineers and 70 lawyers and so no matter what this statement says in terms of his uh, thing of carpentry selling and mathematics because we tend to do what we tend to do is we tend to ignore the base rate and make similarity statements that uh, people who are uh, who does carpentry or people who does sailing or does mathematical jobs tend to be engineers right so why can't they do it it is because of stereotypes we believe that this is the stereotype of what a engineer is and this is the stereotype of a lawyer is and so what it this is what the result they also got so when they gave uh, uh, when not given the profile, the probability that a ra randomly drawn name was an engineer was 30 upon 100 or uh, 30 percent. However, when the profile was given, 
most people tended to judge that a random name was a engineer was 50 percent and this is the error because they ignored the base rate that if there are only 30 engineers the probability cannot be 50 percent. Now, use of representative heurist and the concomitant tendency to ignore base rate may relate to something called racial profiling. So, when we tend to say that certain kind of races or, or people who are blacks tend to do more tend to be more thieves or tend to be do more violent acts this is basically called racial profiling or rate people who are blacks as to be more uh, criminal in nature this is because we ignore the base rate. We believe that if some people some black people do it we tend to over extrapolate it and believe that any black that we see we tend to believe that he is the one who is doing this kind of thing. Now, another interesting thing or another reason why this kind of representative heurist is used or the representative heurist uh, tend to fail us in making judgment is the conjugation fallacy. And what does the conjugation fallacy really say? The conjugation fallacy is another cause for bias which are caused by stereotyping. What does it say? So, Travesky and Kanwen demonstrated this fallacy at work. So, they did, the conjugation fallacy is how if there are two events A and B and they occur together, they co-occur together, what is the probability of both happening together. So, let us first look at the statement and then I will explain you how this bias really happens. So, this is the statement that Kahneman and Travesky gave people. So, Linda is 31 year old, she is single, outspoken and very bright. She is majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply consumed with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstration. So, this, this is the basic profile of this person. Now, the subjects were asked to decide whether it was more likely that she was a bank teller or a bank teller who was active in feminist movement. And so, without looking at anything written in the slide after this, tell me what do you think. Most people will agree that statement 2 is correct that Linda is a bank teller who is active in feminist movement. The reason being that the last line of this says that this, she is consumed with discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti nuclear demonstration and so on and so forth. And so, you believe that second is having the more probability, but you are wrong. The reason being that why cannot a bank teller have all this thing and so the chances that she is a bank teller is higher than the chances that he is a bank teller who is active in all these things because any bank teller can have this right. Now, this is what is called the conjugation policy or the conjugation fallacy which is out there. Now, if the probability of statement 1 was 0 0.5 and the probability of statement 2 was 0 0.5 and when we club them together, when we conjugate them together, the probability always has to be 0 0.25 and that is called the conjugation fallacy. When we conjugate two events together, the probability will always be lower. So, a bank teller who is active in feminism will have a cost probability of 0 0.25, whereas a bank teller independently or a feminist has a probability of 0 0.5. And so, this conjugation people do not understand this conjugation and they tend to realize that this will be more whereas this has to be less because that is what probability says right and so that is what it is. Now, the next thing that we look into is another reason for this bias and that is called misinterpretation of cluster events. Now, when given a event that has two ways of working out such as a coin flip people tend to misconstrue with a random sequence should look like. So, people what they tend to do is they tend to misconstrue they tend to misrepresent what a random sequence is all about or how randomization really works. And in this case if, if I give them if I give you to, to judge whether this is more probable or this is more probable, you tend to tell me that this is more probable because it looks like more random. Whereas, if you look into it, both have an equal probability of occurring and none of them are random events. So, this has a probability of one twelfth upon a twelfth probability and here also is the same a single event happening that is what it is and so both events are non random in sequence and but since this looks more random to you you misconstrue that this is more random and you believe that this has a higher probability of occurring and this is the miscalibration that you tend to do then this because this looks more subtle this looks more arranged and so cannot be a random sequence now examples of misinterpretation of cluster events now, what is the interpretation of this misinterpretation of cluster events one example is called the hot hand and what is it the tendency to misperceive event clusters as indicating non randomness may underlie when sports fan term as hot hand what is what is hot hand hot hand is basically a feature in which we believe that if some player is going very well he is burning hot uh, white 
like the sun and so in the next match also is going to do well. So, if you are looking at if you are looking at Kohli batting and we believe that in 1, 2, 3 match he has done good. We believe that in the fourth match also is going to do good because he is in that streak that winning streak and so that is the problem. Each match is independent of itself and each player is independent of itself and his own probability and so the chances that because he did good in 3 matches the fourth match is going to do good is something called the hot hand. Similarly, is called something called gambler's fallacy and so what happens in gambler's fallacy? We tend to believe that if we are failing, if a gambler is failing or if we are not getting good results, then the next result that is going to be good is going is, is or coming is going to be good because it is due in us and that is called, uh, uh, called gambler's fallacy. So, if you are playing let us say a card game and three times you have failed, we believe that the fourth time you are going to win. The reason being that it is this winning is due on you, three failures will lead to uh, the fourth winning. Whereas, we all know that each event is independent of itself and each has an independent probability of 1 upon 6 in terms of a dice, 1 upon 53 in terms of a card game or so on and so forth. And so, that is what the difference is all about. And the last theory is that we need to see here is something called the anchoring and adjustment theories. And what is anchoring and adjustment theories? In many cases judgment, people start with an idea or standard in mind and the initial estimate of the first impression tends to make ourselves as overly biased. So, in anchoring and adjustment theories, what we tend to do is before making judgments, we anchor ourselves, we, we look inside ourselves or our experiences and believe that this is what the value should be and then we tend to then make judgments based on the anchor that we have kept. So, we, we tend to look into ourselves and believe that this is how it something is going to be. So, if uh, let us uh, take an example. So, if you ask your parent that or you give a statement to a parent says, saying that this is what I spend each day, they will anchor that when they were of your age, what is the amount of money that they used to spend and based on then they will make adjustments and say that you are overspending because when they were young and they were at of your age, they used to spend let us say 10 rupees per day and based on that they made some calculations of what over the years that have given and so they will say that your daily spending should be 50 rupees, but you know that 50 rupees is not what is good and so this anchoring adjustment is another problem with a heuristic. What they tend to do is what they tend to do when they were when they were little like you, they would make that statement or they will make that an anchor and then make adjustments and based on that decide your pocket money or decide, uh, decide your daily spending and that is what is called the anchoring and adjustment heurist. So, the heurist involved in these judgments is terms anchoring and adjustment. A good example of this is something called the spotlight effect. What is spotlight effect? In spotlight effect, uh, what really happens is if somebody is wearing. So, so if, if I wear a torn cloth and when I enter a room, I believe that everybody is looking at me and I become overly conscious. The fact is that nobody looks at me. So, when you wear a pink shirt or where you wear a yellow shirt to class or you are made to wear a yellow shirt to class, you believe that everybody is looking at you and this is called the spotlight effect and this is a good example of anchoring and adjustment. The reason is that you anchor yourself saying that I am since I am wearing this disgusting cloth and so everybody is looking at you and then you make the adjustment that everybody is looking at you. You make yourself the anchor and then you make this adjustment that everybody is looking at you and so you overestimate the number of that uh, people look at you. As an, uh, a number of experiments were done where it was people were made to do this kind of a disgusting wearing cloth going into this, into a room and they were later asked how many people noticed you and the people were actually asked how many people noticed it and it was found that there was a huge gap of how many pe people actually noticed them and how many people did the person wearing the disgusting cloth actually thought we are looking at and this is called the anchoring and adjustment heurist. Now, our judgments can also be biased or our judgments can also be faulty in terms of certain biases which are out there. So, biases in judgments can also arise from the fact that at times we are not good at estimating how much we know or when we knew it. Now, a couple of biases of this type is called one of the biases called the hindsight bias and what is hindsight bias? People often seem to know for sure about something has occurred that they new things would work out just the way they are and this is the tendency of what is called I knew it all along hindsight bias and some, so at times this hindsight bias of how what people think that they knew is what is the bias or what is the kind of error that can happen in terms of judgment and it is more evident in civil suit. So, in civil suit a judge has to determine 
uh, the probability defendant would have foreseen the what would a plaintiff would have done. So, let us say that a plaintiff did some kind of a, a defendant de did some kind of an gross negligence and this gross negligence leads to some kind of a problem to a plaintiff. Now, the plaintiff then goes ahead and files a defamation suit against the defendant for certain kind of money or certain kind of compensation. Now, the plaintiff will go to court as well and now the court person who is the judge has to decide whether the defendant would have seen that this kind of whatever act he did from that this kind of problem would have arisen to the plaintiff or not. And so, most judges then fall to this error of hindsight bias and believe that the defendant could have very easily ascertained that if he did something this is the kind of problem that would have arisen and would have made the plenty of suffer and they rule in favor of it. And so, this basically what is hindsight bias? It is basically the fact that people say that I knew it all, all along or the bias that people think that they knew all, all along and they did not look into it. So, that kind of a thing is the hindsight bias. Another kind of bias is something called miscalibration of confidence. So, at times we tend to miscalibrate our confidences about something and we tend to make errors. For example, the fact that we overestimate the extent to which we knew something was going to happen demonstrates an insensitivity to what we knew and what, what we knew and when we knew it. And sometimes we tend to make overconfidences. We tend to be overconfident of what is going to happen and when it is going to happen. For example, any kind of thing that we can take. So, if an experiment were done in which people were given a statement to verify and they were asked to first be positive that whatever statement was given to be verified, they have to be uh, first uh, rate their confidences and then based on their confidences, the truth value is generated. So, a certain statement was given to people and they were asked to rate this statement as correct or not and their confidence ratings were done. So, it, it was found out then people who said that they were 100 percent confident that they knew the statement was true, it was found out the accuracy was 75 percent only and people who, who were lower in terms of confidences uh, were had more accurate accuracies and so this kind of errors do arise and that is called miscalibration of confidences. Right. So, in this particular uh, section then on reasoning and uh, judgment, what we tended to do is we tended to carry forward from what we did in the last section. In the last section, we looked at uh, what is uh, reasoning and we looked at something called uh, deductive reasoning in terms of conditional reasoning and syllogistic reasoning. In today's lecture, what we did was we looked at what is called inductive reasoning and what uh, what is the format of an inductive reasoning and what are the possible errors which can be there. From there on, we moved into something called judgment, which is basically making meaning or based on the evidences providing some kind of a estimate that is what uh, judgment is all about. And so, we looked at what is judgment and we looked at three basic types of heuristics which can affect judgment, the availability heurist, the representative heurist and the anchoring and adjustment heurist. And in addition to that, we also looked at what is biases, the kind of biases that can be uh, there and these biases how they can affect our judgment. For example, one is called the hindsight bias, I knew it all along kind of a thing. So, this, this you tend to hap happen to know uh, all the time, when you fail you tend to say that I knew it all along and so that kind of a bias is always there because you tend to say that you knew it all along. And then there was second bias which was misinterpreting confidences of how confidence you are onto something. So, this is the end of this section on uh, reasoning and judgment. When we meet next, we will be discussing a section on decision making and we will be carrying on some of the things that we have learned there, uh, learned here onto that and we look at how people make choices of judgments that has been done. So, when a reasoning is done and out of that reasoning certain judgments or certain kind of judgments are evaluated, certain kind of facts are brought forward and certain kind of rules are laid out, how do we choose among the alternatives which are available after judgment that is what in decision making that is what we are going to see in the next section on decision making, how choices are made among the alternatives which are available after judgment and reasoning. Thank you.